Here there's probably one of two people here. You're either an employer or you're in the uh, hiring space or you're looking for an amazing job with an awesome company or you're an awesome company looking for awesome people. One or the other, um, there's two things I want to get across. Number one, that I've figured it all out, that I uh, have this awesome, unbelievable, unmatched company and I've uh, cracked the code when it comes to hiring perfectly, okay, and vice versa. But I've got a lot of battle scars. Uh, I own a few businesses. My name's Josh Rhodes, um, the CEO of uh, Agent Leads. We are a real estate marketing agency and consultancy. Uh, we serve the entire North American residential real estate body. Uh, we do Facebook ads and lead follow-up and lead cultivation and um, done the Inc. 5000 list. Uh, we utilize sales funnels and a company called Click Funnels is Given us a, a few awards, and um, I own another business called GroovyMarketing.biz, which actually started out as like a little side hustle, and ended up being a significant business for my family and I. Where basically I help coach and consult with entrepreneurs and uh, client-based um, businesses or client services-based business agencies and consultancies. So uh, that's just to kind of get you in the galaxy and, and kind of give you some context and some framework. Uh, of what I do and the, the perspective, I guess, or the flavor that I'm bringing uh, to the room today. Um, and I'm going to like uh, just lift the lid a little bit um, when it comes to uh, what awesome companies look like in my opinion and what amazing people need to know in order to interact with those awesome companies or be employed, or if you're an awesome company, how in the world do you recruit these people mm -hmm. that could move the ball down the field, if you will, uh, for your business? So um, here's a quick look at our awesome company, and the reason why we're awesome are the people on our organizational chart. Um, this is Agent Leads, like I said, this is our team, um, and obviously I won't go into the life story of all these people, but uh, we have a leadership team, and we have a sales team, and a customer success team. Uh, we've got some key marketers on the team now. Uh, I play the role of CEO. Uh, Sam Hill, uh, my business partner, is the president. Uh, and then um, we have spent the last three years building the company where it is now. Uh, a lot of the folks here are on the, on the organizational chart are housed here at Forge. We grow our business uh, here at Forge. Uh, but we also have virtual team members. As a matter of fact, we just hired two people in Hawaii in the last uh, 14 days who uh, play the role as lead assistants on our team. Um, the big thing about Agent Leads is that we help uh, the bleeding neck pain that residential real estate agents have, which is they don't have enough leads and they don't know how to follow up with them properly, basically. And that's what we do for them as a proxy agency and we help get them closer to the pen on commission checks. And that's capitalism, right? We help uh, solve a problem with our solution. So all that being said, why is it that these people are willing to earn their living with our company? That's a question I ask myself a lot. Like, okay, they could go work anywhere in Birmingham, they could go work anywhere they want. They're super talented, great, amazing people. Why would they work with us? And then. In turn, also, as a hiring business owner or manager, I have to also ask the questions often, well, why, why did we hire them to begin with? Um, and specifically, what are awesome companies looking for? And I think that's just a perspective that we need to take into account. Even if um, you're not a, a business owner, I think it's great to know both sides of the game, because at the end of the day, hiring, employment, uh, having a dream job, not having a dream job, uh, that's kind of, it's, it's, it's a tennis match, right? There's a, there's a, there's a back and forth uh, relationship. And so um, some things that I've gathered, uh, whether it being employed at other companies in, earlier in my career or leading companies as a, a, a team leader or president or now owning my own companies, I've just really tried to boil it down for our purposes today for two or two to four simple elements um, that you can harness and walk out with and go, okay, Josh said this and this, I'm gonna weaponize these with my personality and gifts 
and my desires, and, and I'm going to use these as my uh, arsenal, if you will, in, 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 the, in the workforce, okay? So, what are they looking for? Well, I want to start with what they are not looking for. Believe it or not, um, funny, funny pick, fun pick, um, the, the, the idea is, as, a, as an employer, sure, I want Clark Kent and Donna, whatever her real name is in the comic books, but Wonder Woman and Superman is, of course, who we always want to hire. I'll, you know, we want 16 Supermans on the team. But the reality starts to set in with these rainbow-chasing hiring managers at some point that everyone's not Superman and Wonder Woman. And that's okay. We don't have to be that. Um, what they are looking for uh, are the following two uh, key things. All right, These are the two key things that, uh, if you're in the room, uh, really matter to you. And some of them uh, are going to be things that you're, you already have in your possession, and some of them may not be. Okay, Number one values, um, core values. We have uh, core values. You saw, you may have seen them on our organizational chart a minute ago, but we hire based on core values. Now, there's different sequencing and different periods of maturity in a company's life where core values uh, need to be matched with something else, which I'll get to in a second. But baseline, at the end of the day, when we start interviewing recruits for our company, the first conversation has a theme, and that is uncovering the core values of the individual. Um, some of our core values at Agent Leads are we take ownership, uh, we encourage each other, uh, we believe in speed. One of our core values is that we're a sales-driven organization. And the reason why we push out core values so quickly in the recruiting process is because we want to either scare you off with your hair on fire running into the woods, I do not want to work for that company, or we want you to be attracted to that, uh, attracted to those core values. And if you are magnetized by those core values, and there's a really good chance we're going to have a long-term successful relationship as teammates and team members. Um, but core values often aren't things that are acquired over a short period of time. So if Josh walks into your office and you're just like, hey, our core values are uh, we encourage each other and we don't take ourselves too seriously. But Josh takes himself too seriously it's going to be very apparent very quickly in a hiring process. And it's not something I can really fake. Or if I do fake it and I make it to that point, it's going to be something that comes out and it's going to hurt uh, in six weeks after you've fooled everyone or after the company has fooled you. Come on in. Um, the, the core values are things, and I always use this illustration back when I was playing baseball. Like, I played some upper level baseball. And there got to a point where in college, um, I played here at Sanford, and there was a guy on the team. I was I was I had I'd gone to baseball camps, and I had um, I had worked all my life um, and to to play college baseball. And then there was a dude on the baseball team who had never played organ organized game of baseball. He had never uh, hit a home run. He'd never played with a uniform on in an organized game, but he was on a college baseball team. And I was like, how in the world, how did this guy get here? And the coach looked at me and said, the guy can run a 4-3-40, which is really fast. It's like gazelle speed. And you can't teach speed. We'll teach him how to catch and hit. And I was just like, you know, massive life learning right then and there that um, there are some things that you already possess, whether it be you know, your upbringing, your, your, your worldview, that you can harness and bring to a company that's really going to help you uh, not only land a job. Like if you're just trying to land a job, you're going to find yourself um, in, a, in a shortfall pretty soon. What you want is to find not only somewhere to survive, but to thrive. 
And the things that are going to ultimately allow you to survive and thrive are the core values that you bring to the table, which is why self-development is really a big deal. It's why it's a massive industry. It's also a reason why a lot of uh, awesome companies have development programs, training programs, etc. whether that be mindset or other things. But don't take for granted what your mom and them taught you. And if you, don't, if you didn't have the luxury of having a great upbringing, that's okay. And especially if you're listening to this speech right now, you probably have some core values that makes you want to win. And so you've got to figure out a way to really promote those core values early in the conversation with an awesome company because I'm telling you, they want to know if you're quote unquote a good person. And then after that, they can teach you how to pitch and catch whatever specialization or industry that they're in. Does that make sense? Does that, does that ring a bell? Okay, so number one's values. Just don't take that for granted. Elevate your values. Number two, skills. This is something I think that people also take for granted. Um, for example, graphic design. That's a skill that is acquired and then allows you to be valuable on a certain plane to certain companies at certain times and sequences in their growth, right? So at the end of the day, um, if you are not acquiring skills, it's gonna be really hard to go work with an awesome company. And that sounds super generic, so let me give you another illustration. Um, for a long time, I worked in uh, parachurch, nonprofit uh, world, like ministry um, kind of world. And it was great. But what I found was I used that, for me specifically, I used that arena as uh, an arena where I wasn't necessarily supposed to be. And what I meant by that was I went there, I convalesced to that because it was familiar to me, it was familiar to my upbringing, it was familiar to a trajectory that I was supposed to be on according to other people. And I, I stopped acquiring skills in, that are valuable maybe to a commercial entity or a business. And then around uh, 2010, I think, I started um, uh, self-training in the internet marketing world and started acquiring a very specific skill of email marketing and copywriting. And um, then I started a website, uh, oh, I started a, my first online website called Groovy Bicycle. I had no idea what I was doing, except the point of the whole website was to uh, drop ship fixed gear bicycles from San Francisco in some, some warehouse all over the contiguous uh, 48 states. Anyone who would buy it. And when Facebook advertising just came out, which was, I don't know, light years ago, but according to, compared to now, but um, I started learning Facebook advertising on the front of the tidal wave. And I just started getting familiar. I was like, oh wow, people are logging in 14 to 16 times a day. And they, th that is something probably that I could sell my bicycles on. They weren't even mine, I didn't hold inventory. What would happen is somebody would go to my website, it would buy it from me, and I would just turn around, obviously, and order it from the, the warehouse in San Francisco. Well, needless to say, because I was novice and I didn't, I, I didn't know how to run a business and I didn't have great acute skills, that business crashed and burned because I didn't know what I was doing yet. But the phoenix from the ashes was is groovy marketing which is now a successful, legitimate business, uh, my second uh, business that I own. And the, 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 the reason why it was a phoenix from the ashes is because the failure of the first business actually was the toll or the tax that I paid to cross the skill bridge. It's what permitted me to go from one side of the canyon to the other. And when I got to the other side of the canyon, I wasn't rich. I, you know, I barely had the shirt on my back, but I knew what not to do and what to do. And from that point on, my skill 
my, um, uh, my career escalation just took off. And then I learned phone sales. I learned how to, uh, the art of persuasion over the phone. I learned how to get a, a great offer, make a great offer to someone who has a pain and a problem that the offer would fix and get their credit card from them over the phone in a 30 to 45 minute conversation. And that skill by itself, and I'm not saying everybody in this room needs those two skills, these are just example skills, but hyper acute skills that allow you to do one or two things. Number one, move the ball down the field for you, get you closer to monetization, or get the company that you want to work for closer to meeting their monetization goals, okay? So I, I, I stayed on, on that a little longer than I wanted to, but if you have a question about skills in a minute, I can help fine tune it or help you get in the ballpark of what you need to be looking for. What makes an awesome company? What makes a company awesome? Um, is it a great boss? Is it a cool office? Again, I would say it's two things. And these two things uh, are specific, very specific. And these are things that if you're looking for an awesome company, you need to be on the lookout for. And um, I, would, I would probably say these are the litmus test, um, the die test, because it'll also help you figure out if the company really is a facade. Okay, just got back from Vegas. The, the city is awesome, but it's really just like a propped up city, right? There's just a lot of facade there, um, not a whole lot of depth. And so you can, you can find a Vegas company or you can find an awesome company. And specifically, um, what you need to look for is, does the company have a purpose and a mission? Now, I'm not saying they need to like always be saving uh, orphans in another company type mission. That doesn't have to be it. That'd be awesome. If you want to work for a, a purpose-based company, fantastic. I'm just saying they need a purpose for existing outside of sanitizing their greed. <laughs> if they're in it just for sanitized greed purposes, you're going to have a hard time uh, uh, gelling with uh, that company long-term. The purpose of the company is meant to be the North Star that the company will never reach. It just pulls the company's boat through the dark waters of small business or corporate business um, at all times. It's the thing, it's the gravity uh, of the business. Let me show you our purpose and our mission, okay? The purpose and the mission are two different things, okay? Purpose, North Star, Everest mission, we're not going to probably get there. Um, Mission is a current mission that is tangible and reachable and is like base camp one on the Everest mission. For agent leads, our purpose is to help residential real estate agents succeed. Somewhat vague, but at the same time, everyone in our company who, uh, who logs in every day to work for us, they just know why their role exists. It's to help real estate agents, specifically residential real estate agents, succeed. There's a client avatar in mind. There's a customer avatar in mind. Our current mission that's set for April 1st of 2019 that I'm really excited about is to create and actively manage a world-class portfolio of 300 monthly lead generation uh, customers by April 1st, 2019. We uh, just do, so, so every day, someone's talking about mission 300 in our business. Slack communications, financial reports that come out daily, uh, customer success metric team, uh, team, it all comes together and everyone knows what the scoreboard is. Everyone knows that they won or lost uh, that week or that day because there's a clear mission. Um, so when you're interviewing or when you're researching a company, quickly try to find if they have, and they might use different semantics, right? They may use different language, but find if that kind of um, language is somewhere that is articulate enough to where you can go, oh, I'm going to hang my hat on that every day. And then see if it's just congruent with what you want to do, right? See if your skills and your values can plug in and make sure that happens. It's a big deal. Okay, so purpose, mission. That's what you need to be looking for. Number two, what you need to be looking for, metrics. If you 
you don't want to get a job or work for a company and spin your wheels, then find a company that has clear metrics for its team members. And I have an asterisk I want to put on this. Um, as a company, this is a screenshot of some arbitrary metrics that we, that we tackle um, as a business. Everybody on our team is assigned one to three metrics. Those metrics are either result-based metrics or activity-based metrics. Activity meaning I do this activity without measurement. There's not necessarily a numeric result to it. So like every day by 5 p.m., uh, I respond to customer service tickets upon, you know, that have been um, opened up in the customer service inbox. That's an activity-based metric. A result-based metric is I'm responsible for getting 15 uh, sales every single month on the phone for Agent Leads Pro, one of our go-forward uh, platform services. Now, why do I say that you want to look for a company that measures performance with metrics? It's because the company who measures a number, that number is what grows. The number that you measure is the number that grows. And so when you find a company who's purposeful enough, who has a, 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 an acute enough mission that they're so concerned about hitting that they would reverse engineer it into micro actions every day that need to be attained by its team members, you know that they kind of reverse engineered the Jenga puzzle of business. And that you're gonna find yourself on a winning team because the right things are being thought about and measured. Instead of going into a world of ambiguity, ambivalence, just let's just throw spaghetti on the wall all the time. Have you ever been in an environment where the boss every day changes their mind? They're like, hey, do this. No, you know what? Let's do this. Let's change. Let's change. They're always doing this. Now, I'm not to say the asterisk here is there's pivots always. Businesses need to pivot and iterate. But the ones that you feel like you're on the Wabash cannonball roller coaster with, it's usually because they don't have good metrics in place. And sometimes metrics aren't gonna be in place at the very beginning, especially if you are higher on your core values and not on an existing position. Sometimes people are hired because they're just freaking awesome people. And so we're gonna create a position for you. And so then metrics are things that you need to be asking for. Hey, in about four to six weeks, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Supervisor, can you please be working on assigning me metrics so that I know when I win and when I lose and what that looks like, okay? Um, for amazing companies uh, listening to this that are looking for awesome people, uh, you need to be able to have a good recruiting recipe, right? Um, I'm gonna walk through a quick, easy, simple uh, recruiting recipe that we use internally, and uh, then we'll talk about uh, how you can reverse that as a job seeker and then we'll have Q&A. This is uh, inner fourth grader stuff. This is super simple, okay? A, B, C, right? This is a, a marketing framework or a marketing recipe that we use to acquire customers and clients, but it's also something that we've deployed to find awesome people, and it's worked. A stands for attract attention. B stands for build a list. And C stands for convert recruits. In marketing, it would be attract traffic, build the list, convert sales. Attract attention, build the list of recruits, convert recruits based on purpose, mission, match, core values, skills. So all of it comes together. So if you are recruiting or if you're a hiring manager, using ABC, it's non-specific purposefully, but attract attention might be a particular platform of advertising, whether it be uh, a recruiting firm or a recruiting platform online or Facebook ads to hire somebody. Any of those things can be deployed in order to get the attention of the um, qualified pockets of people that you want to recruit. Building the list is the part then that often gets taken advantage or taken for granted, which is, um, we've got people's attention, but we didn't give them a clear call to action. We didn't get their information, and we didn't compile a list. 
right now I have a list of about 10 to 20 recruits in my, on my computer right here that at any moment we can go back to and re-engage in a conversation for uh, specifically our, our entry level uh, positions that we hire every 30 to 45 days right now. Um, and then converting recruits is part of all of the, two, the key things that I've talked about so far. It's the hiring process that engages on the core values, engages on the purpose and the mission, and figures out what skills that you've acquired in your journey so that you can maybe play a role on our team. Uh, for awesome people looking for amazing companies, the same is true. You have got to figure out how to attract attention from amazing companies. You've got to build a list of companies that you want to work for or aspire to work for. And you've got to convince them why your core values and your skill set is going to move their metrics down the football field to the end zone for them. You don't have to forgive my allegories. I'm a word picture guy. A, B, C. Okay? So, I'm, I've talked a lot, and I'll stop talking for a second and see if anybody or if I've uh, created any question marks, and we can hash it out. Is anybody specifically in the job market right now? Okay. What's the biggest barrier that you're, you feel like you have faced so far? What's the, the quote-unquote problem in the marketplace? You go first. <laughs> it just seems like it's really competitive. Like, I feel like I have a lot of things to offer, but I'm not really being given an opportunity because I, I mean, I've only been here a month in Birmingham. Like, sure. Really like, I know that a lot of jobs are found like through people you know, and I, yeah. I haven't really like, met a lot of people yet. Um, so I guess I've kind of a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're yeah. You you haven't had boots on the ground here long because you moved here yeah. not long ago. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. But it's competitive, is what you feel. I feel like it is. Yeah. Like a, a couple of the like rejection letters I've got um, have said that they've had like over five hundred applicants. Yeah. Something. Sure. I don't know if they're exaggerating or. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I think that I think the job market's really good right now. Um, or let me say very competitive right now. It's been, it's been difficult for us recruiting. We, we in the last uh, 16 months, we particularly have had to step up our game to get the people we want instead of another company getting them. So that's, it's a, it's an interesting feedback. Let me know if we can help you, you know, if there's anything, any particular question. What else? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so from a company standpoint or a recruiter standpoint, what if they're comparing two people with similar skill sets and similar qualities, how do you define which How do you choose? Yeah. Like, what is a recruiter going to look for if they're comparing two people with similar values? How do recruiters do that? I can talk from my hiring manager well, or business owner perspective, but I think recruiters, <coughs> that's a, those are two different questions, and they work for ITAC here in town, so I think that would be good. So the type of recruiting that we do is um, – we're not making the decisions. We're not corporate recruiters, right? So we're from a third party. So in, in our instance, the hiring manager would make that decision. So here's how I do it. Would I like to go have a beer with applicant A more than applicant B? Let's hire applicant A. And then when the metrics get red or yellow instead of green, we've got applicant B. Great example. We had two great recruits recently who we're in the exact same position. We're just like, core values, check. Skills, check. They understand our purpose and mission, check. Which one do you just like talking to more? Let's go with her. And then let's tell the other one that we're probably gonna hire them in 30 to 45 days because we know that that's kind of part of our growth trajectory. So at some point, you just have to um, lean on likability, which is kind of, daunting for some people, you know, but likability is a big deal, so. What else? That's a good question. It's a very good point, though. I've been in a situation where I've helped hire people. Yeah. And uh, my final question was always, like, if I get stuck on a plane ride to L.A. with this person for eight hours, could I tolerate them that long? And there's, I mean, that honestly has made the decision sometimes, and I think it's paid off because you don't want to get stuck in working with somebody that you can't even get along with, you can't tolerate Sometimes you can feel that in an interview. Yeah. 
so you put your best foot forward, you try to, maybe if you're interviewing for a job, you show them that you're likable. Don't just talk about business, talk about yourself, talk about what you love to do. And that's, I think that's helpful. That's a great question. I like that one. Yeah, I, I've just kind of always gotten the impression that uh, because I've gotten the degrees, I've gotten the professional certifications, uh, I've gotten some awesome jobs over the years, but when, it, when it's come to director, upper management positions, it just never seems to, to play out. And I didn't know if the reason was because it's me or the fact that I'm a graduate of an HBCU, hmm. which is historically black college or university. Hmm. So, you know, of course, there are cultural differences, sure. however slight they may be. But uh, bridging the gap, and, and, you know, my response was start my own business. And so I have two business ventures now. Because yeah, I've done everything I was supposed to do to, to get to the next level. But, I love it. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I don't know. Bridging that gap has just been a challenge. You know, totally. when, it, when it comes to that upper management position, when I've done everything else I, I, I need to do. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, with, you bring up like a hyper, like acute area of career, which is that getting to the management or director level. Um, obviously, you and I don't know each other, so what I'm about to say isn't a reaction to what you said. But and I don't mean in a racist sort of way. I mean, no, no. What, what I was going to say is like for our leadership team right now, or our team, the thing that I'm, um, what I'm doing, because we have a young leadership team. Matter of fact, our management team is um, inexperienced, I would say. But that's because of the anthropology of our team. Like, we're a young team. We're a young company. Um, and we, we bootstrap. We didn't take any venture capital money. We didn't take any investor money. So, like, we've paid for ourselves so far. And we've leaned on core values and not 20 years management experience resumes. Does that make sense? So now what I'm having to do with our management team is work on soft skills, the leadership stuff, the intangible stuff that allows them to escalate not only up our org chart more, but so that they can develop the leaders that they've been put in charge of, their particular metrics. And I think a lot of times, and you know, not the, what was your name? It's Willie. Not specifically to Willie's situation, but if, if there's other people in the room or online listening and they're in a in a particular situation like Willie was in, you know, there comes a point where the skills and the core values are going to meet the metrics and you got that you got hired for. And so some companies are just gonna be happy for you to meet metrics until you know the cows come home. Like there's just gonna always be the repeatable unit that has to be done. At Lowe's, somebody's got to just refill the box of screwdrivers when they when when everybody buys them out. Somebody's got to go to the back and refill them. Well, if you're tired of refilling the screwdriver box, then there are other skills to be acquired. It may be a different uh, specific scalpel-like tr uh, skill, like I was talking about with Facebook ads. Like that's a really scalpel-like advertising lead generation skill. Um, or it might be softer <laughs> skills that are more like management skills, leadership skills, and sometimes that can manifest in a certification or, hey, I went to, uh, to you know, so-and-so and I got a, a six-week certification, and some, some companies will value that. Um, and then some of it is going to the company going, hey, I see you have a stable of, of, of employees over here that are meeting these metrics. If I were able to 2x, 3x the production of those metrics without you having to hire more people, could I potentially have a leadership role in that area of the business? And go work for free in, for, a term, for a period of time? What I mean by that is go work in a leadership capacity without the leadership compensation for a time period and prove to them without financial risk to them that you can pull it off and then ask on the front end for specific terms, hey, if I can achieve greatness in 12 weeks, would you guys be willing to ch change my job title, give me extra comp, blah, 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 and extra benefits, so things like that. Just to ask the question a different way, and, yeah. and I, I will, I'll be done. Um, You're good. I don't play golf. I'm an excellent basketball player. Most business transactions occur on the golf course. You know? So for me, 
I just need to learn how to play golf. <laughs> is, is, Sometimes. Yeah. I mean, is, is that how I bridge the gap this evening? Is that your suggestion? Sometimes. I mean, I wouldn't get hyper focused on golf. Uh, I I don't do any of my business transactions there, but it's a good illustration. Yeah, yes. because I've seen people with, with fewer experience with total promotions over myself. Absolutely. So learn how to play golf. Look, yeah, and and that might be uh, twelve or fifteen other different ideas or, 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 or things that you can do. But yeah, attract traffic. Well, golf's the platform for a lot of people to attract the attention of the right people. Um, build the list, convert sales. You're always selling. Like you may be in the room and be like, man, I'm not a salesperson. Well, you are. You're, you're either selling your values or you're selling your skills at all times. And figure out a way, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, it's not, an, it's, not, it's not a personality thing, it's a communication thing. Um, like communication skills. Like I would say Willie's got great communication skills just by interacting with him so far. It's probably something that he could leverage easily in a workplace and what's allowed you to have two business enterprises of your own now. But, um, anyway, uh, other questions before I get too wordy? Yeah, what's your process like? So once you've filtered and narrowed down the candidates, are you doing phone interview, in-person interview, and how many interviews do you do with those people? Good question. All right. Um, we do at minimum four interviews. And on the first interview, I'm always just like, hey, look, we're about to put you through the gauntlet, but it's not gonna be six weeks. We start interviewing pretty soon. Like when we know we need to hire someone, we start the interview process. And the first interview is core values. The second interview is skills. And then the third and the fourth interview is variety. Getting someone else on the team that may or may not be on the leadership team to interview, some, interview the, the candidate. After the fourth interview, um, I or Sam have gotten feedback the whole process. And we pr you don't get to the fourth interview, first of all, unless you nail the first interview, right? Um, if we picked up on the fact that you, your core values match our core values, and I'm, I always ask the question, did you see the core our core values on, on our webpage that we that you applied for this job on? Yes. Did any of those make sense? I asked that question. And they're usually like, and I can tell who's paid attention to the core values and who hasn't paid attention to the core values. Um, and then I start asking them, well, did any of them do any of them need more explanation? And that's not a gotcha question as much as it is like, you know, some people when you say we believe in speed, they have no idea what, you know, we believe in illegal drugs, like what do we believe in, right? So what does that mean? And so I want people to have the fair playing field of understanding in that first interview, what we're talking about. And then the rest of the gauntlet is just making sure that Josh doesn't pick someone he likes, which is the flip flop of your question from earlier. It's not just about the manager having a biased uh, opinion about someone which, by the way, my leadership team saved us from a bad hire uh, in November because I loved their skill set. I, I wanted their skill set for our company so bad. Um, but when they came in for interviews in person, they really, they really botched it. And I actually botched the hiring process by interviewing on skills first and not core values. I'm human. <laughs> what else? Other questions? Ways we can help you, particularly, yes? So, can you give us some examples when you say you hire, you, the first interview is about core values, what do you do to seek out those core values? And then how would you, like if somebody's interviewing and not, they're not asking about core values, what would the interviewee, how would they get across those? Yep. It's all about the questions you ask, obviously. Which, by the way, and I think our resident recruiters in the room would agree with this, like hiring, like a hiring pipeline and a sales pipeline are this, almost the same thing. Like I might be selling you Acme widgets over here, but I'm really selling you the opportunity over here to work with us so that we can sell more Acme widgets. Like it's all a sales in my head. And so one of the key sales techniques that I've picked up over the years is the secret weapon is to ask questions. 
ask questions to back them into the corner so that they have really only, not to coerce them, but to go, oh, they don't you remove the objections that they might come up with with their inner narratives um, that fill their brain. And so asking the right questions help you find out the core values. What are some example questions that I ask? Um, ironically, I usually don't ask them hypothetical questions. I don't say, well, hey, if you're in this situation with teammate A and teammate B, and the customer says this, how do you respond? I normally don't do that because it's just so fabricated and it's not a good litmus test. I almost always rely on them telling me about their experience and asking them things like, um, uh, demonstrate, or t can you tell me a story uh, from the job you have right now that really inspires you? Like, what about what you do right now inspires you? And what that's going to tell me is that this person is not fatalistic. They're not a victim. They, if they can come up with something aspirational about their current state of life, which, by the way, they're trying to leave. Like, they wouldn't be interviewing if they weren't. But if they can, if they can uh, apply optimism, then there's a really good chance that they don't take themselves too seriously, um, that they're, they have the ability to encourage others. And so we just use those values as a lens in our question asking throughout the entire first, first um, interview. Does that make sense? Cool. Question, where do you get most of your candidates from? Social media. LinkedIn. Facebook. Oh, wow. A lot. Um, LinkedIn, ironically, no, for our field, um, just because of the age and skill sets that we particularly are, are recruiting. Um, online, that's been super helpful as of late, is Zip, Zip Recruiter. Okay. Has been astonishingly successful. Um, but we probably have five to ten online recruiting accounts. Mm -hmm. um, unless, we get, unless we find ourselves in a field of specialization like you guys have, like you have particular industries that you really focus on, then sometimes we might engage with a recruiter for a particular thing. But That's so not far, where I was asking. I was just curious. No, no I get it. No, but, but we, and we have engaged with um, primarily online recruiting sites. Just, yeah. But here's the thing, like, I actually don't prefer that route. That's when you get 500 resumes. Correct. And I yeah. think that's what happens. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, to kind of throw an angle in there, um, a lot of the awesome companies, uh, ironically, aren't promoting their. I mean, let me back up. That, that's going to come out wrong and incorrect. If you find yourself in, a, in the red ocean, looking for a job where there's 500 applicants, I can almost always assure you and promise you that there's an equally if not 10 times better job at a smaller boutique firm that's gonna pay you as well um, as the company getting 500 applications. So that's a, um, kind of how you, uh, <laughs> Instagram, uh, kind of how you gauge your target audience. From the even from the job seeking standpoint, like your target audience, you know, if you want to go get a, a, a job at Regions Bank or shipped right now, like red ocean, it's just a red ocean. You need to find the blue ocean where less sharks are swimming and eating all the bait. There's actually a great book called Blue Ocean Strategy that's built around marketing and sales, but you get the point. Um, last last thought, and we'll we'll wrap up in the next three minutes. In that same breath, you guys watch American Idol. Like we, I tell this to a lot of my consulting clients uh, um, and service clients. Like um, sometimes, like I said, sales and hiring, sales and employment are very, very much the same game. If you are a service provider and you've picked the wrong industry to work in, it's going to be really hard. You got to pick the right market. You got to pick the right industry. Pick the right racehorse so that you can win. On American Idol, how many talented people have you seen them sent home because they picked the wrong song? And it's because 
Maybe you're an unbelievably talented graphic designer, but you're trying to work for a trucking company that doesn't have a vast need for a designer or have a premium compensation uh, need for a designer, but you could come over here and work for you know anybody else that might have to be a small business and get paid multiples. Okay, any other questions? Last, last chance before we wrap up? How do you find like those smaller companies and things like that? S uh, sniper fire. You gotta, you, you gotta get online. You gotta like you, like I literally, if I'm not a business owner, and I'm 38 with a family of three daughters, beautiful wife, and I need to figure out how I'm gonna take care of my family, I'm sending video messages to CEOs on Facebook Messenger, and I'm gonna tell them why their business is gonna work better when I'm in there in their dugout. I mean, who's doing that? Nobody, yeah. and it's just a way to stand out and persuade. And again, that's my personality coming out. There's other creative avenues. Anyway, thank you guys. Appreciate you coming.